If you have ever played any of the modern Elder Scrolls games, then you are more than likely familiar with the different tiers of weapons and armor that are available to the player. Normally, iron is the first set you'll find, and then you can work your way up from there. But what if there was not only something worse than iron, but if by some horrible challenge idea, we were forced to use it for the entire game? What would happen? Well, that's what I've decided to find out for some reason, as today I ask the question, can you beat Oblivion with rusty weapons and armor? A very quick rundown on the pros and cons of this tier of equipment. Cons, they break easily, they do next to no damage, offer very little protection, and full sets of the armor and weapons don't actually exist. As for pros, you get them in the tutorial? Well, sounds like fun, so with all that out of the way, let's begin. First off was picking my race, and it seemed pretty obvious to me that Dark Elf was the best by far. The Dark Elves get 75% resistance to fire, which makes a lot of the early game Daedra a lot more manageable, especially with the equipment I'll be using. The argument could be made for going Orc as Berserk would certainly help to increase my damage output, but considering it's a par, I'll only be able to use it once every day, so its usefulness is limited at best, whereas the Dark Elves resistance is constantly in effect, no matter what. Well, you can't play Oblivion without messing around with the character creator, and straight up breaking the sliders to produce results that were never intended such as making a Dark Elf the same skin colour as a Breton. Velen Dreth is as much of an ass as ever, even to his own kin, but that's not important, as it's time to meet Professor X. I've got a bone to pick with you, Uriel! <laughs> Can't do much at this stage, so for now, let's hear some wise words from the Mythic Dawn. Yes? Cyrodiil is surrounded to the north and east by the lofty Geral and Vallis mountain ranges. Thank you for that, now please go die. After the Emperor and his guards leave, this single rat somehow busts down the stone wall, allowing us to escape, because Boris thought it would be funny to lock the door behind him. Our first weapons are right here thankfully, as I grab the nearby rusty iron bow and rusty iron dagger, which I use to fend off the rats. Well, I use the dagger anyway. I'm going to be a real stickler about this, I cannot use the bow for this run, as while it does fall under the rusty category, the arrows do not. It's not a huge deal if I'm honest, Marksman in Oblivion is pretty bad outside of having a highly enchanted bow, or just using stealth. The dagger does one point of damage per hit if you all are wondering. That's going to be the same as the rest of the weapons, just FYI. Speaking of other weapons, in a chest in the next room we find the rusty iron war axe, along with the rusty iron curious and greaves. The dagger swings faster than the axe, so it's probably better than it for now, but I also prefer axes over daggers, so I am choosing to use it for personal preference alone. The rats and zombies are of no match for me, which is to be expected as we are supposed to be using these weapons for the time being. The drawbacks of the equipment will only really become noticeable once I make it outside. A little further on and we get the rusty iron helmet and shield. What you're seeing right now is pretty much me for the rest of the playthrough, bar a few helpful additions later on. The axe continues to make short work of the rats along with the new goblins who just had to test their metal against me. I was hoping one of them would have a rusty mace, but unfortunately they were just carrying normal iron. Meeting back up with the others, I try to help fight off the Mythic Dawn, keyword is try, without any stat increases I am pretty useless against them. At the very least I get to choose my sign now, and it was between the Steed and the Warrior. Warrior was the clear winner for the added strength and endurance, but speed is always very tempting when I know I'm going to be stuck in heavy armour for the rest of the run. Not much else happens here, so we'll just speed along until I inevitably fail to stop the assassin by posing as a wall. Boris is saddened by the ordeal, and in his rage, he insults me. You're an experienced barbarian, am I right? Rude. It's not exactly the class I had in mind, so I create my own. Obviously, I go with combat specialist along with strength and endurance, and then my major skills are just the ones that will benefit my rusty attire. The only skill that doesn't make sense is probably mercantile, but I realized I'd be purchasing a lot of repair hammers, so I may as well try and get them cheap. With my class created, the weapons now do two damage overall. I'm going to choose to be an optimist, and rather than looking at this as one extra point of damage, I will instead look at it like my weapons now do double damage, making it out of the sewers and I am almost immediately killed by a slaughterfish. This is going to be fun, I can already tell. The bandits nearby are nowhere near as mighty as the fish, and a few well placed swings of the rusty axe secures me the victory. I increased my skills enough in the tutorial that I can level up right away. I am planning to only hit level 3 max, it's anywhere past that point and I'm going to get outclassed very quickly. My stat increases are terrible I am aware, but that's just oblivion for you. I could optimise my next level if I wanted to, but it's so boring to do it that way that I'm just going to opt not to. 
Anyway, back on track, my first stop is the Imperial City to sell off some of the excess loot I found in the sewers so that I may purchase those repair hammers, as well as a few healing potions just to be safe. As prepared as I can be with no way to do the arena as I cannot equip the armor they give me, I head for Wayne and Priory and start the main quest. After mashing through the dialogue, the only worthwhile assistance I get is from Eranor as he hands me a repair hammer. The monks are useless and I hope they all die. Up to the literal gate of hell that's opened, I run past Captain Saliva like some type of silent saviour and jump straight into the portal. The scamps take longer to kill than I initially would have thought, but fortunately that's going to work both ways as my fire resistance proves its worth by rendering their fireballs virtually worthless. The weight function is my best friend in this run, as it's the most efficient way to heal outside of combat, so unlike in difficult fallout runs, I shouldn't need to stock up on healing supplies, at least for now. I convince Vanius to come with me so that we can divide up the enemies. Turns out that doesn't really work, as after only a few hits from his sword, the scamps tend to rush him as they realise he is the real threat here. Not that any of that matters, as he doesn't last very long before getting taken out by a scamp's fireball, leaving me all alone to clean up his mess and ascend the tower. Considering how the scamps were just brushing off my attacks, I was half expecting the Dramora to just laugh in my face. Surprisingly, they were weaker than the scamps in just about every way. Despite their armour, they could barely take a hit. Granted, they still take a few strikes to put down, don't get me wrong, the weapon still does two damage after all, but at least they don't take just as many as the little scamps. I shouldn't be complaining though, weapon experience is tracked per hit, so the longer I smack something, then the more experience I'll get. I may only be leveling up one more time from this point, but there is the chance for more damage as I increase the skill. Speaking of skill gains, I even tried some sneaking. You would think it would be pointless given the armour, but it worked quite well. This is probably because I'm skulking about how Tarantino intended, completely barefoot. A couple more dead or more here and there, and along with some worthwhile blunt skill increases, and I have made it to the Sigil Stone. Taking the thing and the enchantment I got was frost, so either resistance or damage, depending on whether I strap it to a weapon or piece of armour. For now it is not needed and it only does 5 extra points of damage, but when the time comes, it will help to fight creatures that cannot be hurt with normal weapons. Despite only being level 2, the city of Kavach has a few clan fears roaming about along with the normal Daedra. That's wonderful, enemies that damage you if you attack them up close. I would say the assistance of the guard was welcome, but every single reinforcement died retaking the city, except for Savlian and the High Elf whose name I cannot remember. I of course pick up Martin while I'm here, and he certainly helps with his magic, knife and inability to die. I decided that I would level up for the final time while I was here as well, and on the bright side I was able to get a plus 5 to strength, which is more than welcome, along with just a little bit more in endurance and agility. It doesn't take long before we can clear a path to the Count, strip him of his valuables and return to Savlian to complete the quest. I know this isn't mandatory and I can leave right after meeting up with Martin, but to me it's all part of the Oblivion experience, so I choose to do it. Bringing Martin back to the Priory, and it has been attacked by the Mythic Dawn. Prior Mabril is dead by the time we arrive and Brother Piner doesn't do much better, unfortunately. What a shame. Anyway, I head in to check on the amulet now so that after we help Joffrey clear out the stragglers in the chapel, we can just inform him that it's been stolen. We're off to Cloud Roller Temple and after sitting through one of the most awkward meet and greets ever, can get on to tracking down the fashionable cult. That means it's back to the Imperial City to restock and reunite with Boris to plan our next move. He wants me to act natural and talk with him as to not alert the clearly suspicious man in the corner of the room, but the thing is, unless your game has the words gear or solid in it, trying to get me to effectively lay low is probably not going to work for long. That's my way of saying I threw caution to the wind and just planted my axe in the man's head the first chance that I got. There were no repercussions for doing this by the way, in fact, it worked out better as we were able to take him out before he could console command in his weapons and armour. With him taken care of, Boris points me towards his lizard friend and we get to work building up our book collection. Normally, you can just talk to the wood elf to get the book that way, or if the shopkeeper likes you enough, you can persuade him to hand it over to you instead. But for a slight change of pace, I decide to steal it out of the chest in the back of the room. You still need to talk with Gwyneth to further the quest, and doing things this way just results in some slightly different dialogue with him where he threatens to call the guards. Anyway, he informs us that he's meeting with the Mythic Dawn reps in the sewers, which is just fantastic as going by my appearance this time around, that's probably where Tetanus Terry calls home. I relay the info to Boris and on the way out, the Mythic Dawn corpse talks about a time he caught a fish this big. Not much of worth going over on the way to the sponsor, other than I increased my blunt to 50, allowing me to do a sideways power attack that can sometimes disarm opponents. It was also just enough to increase the damage of the axe from 2 to 3, for about 6 swings anyway before its durability would degrade and it would go back down to 2. For convenience sake I just ended up hocking my repair hammers from this point on as I would want as much damage as possible so I want to be repairing my weapons after every single encounter. Much like the last Dawn member I rushed little Cameron Jr with my axe so I can get as much damage in as possible before he raises his defences and starts fighting back. He doesn't have a lot of health so it's not too bad, that said he can also output a lot of damage that could easily make short work of me if it wasn't for Boris rushing in to offer a hand. 
That's one good thing you've probably noticed about Oblivion. A lot of the main quests have you fighting alongside someone else, so even in runs like this, I know at the very least I will have access to a meat shield most of the time. With that, we have the final book, and once we return it to Tarmina, we can push on. But first, we need to wait a few days for her to decipher the hidden messages in the book. Rather than just stand here waiting, I make the most of my time and go around gallivanting about the province. Nothing too out of the ordinary, went to the docks, took in the sights, boarded a pirate ship and killed its entire crew, then claimed self-defense to get away with multiple accounts of murder. You know, the Nurbit special. I would have taken part in the actual pirate hijacking quest on the other boat in the waterfront, but unfortunately to trigger said quest I need to sleep on that boat, which would unfortunately cause me to level up, and as mentioned, going above my current level would bring about more problems and benefits. I did want to do some quests though, so I headed for Coral and after making a mandatory Super Chris Pratt 64 joke, can save this artist from his very creations. The trolls may only be made of paint, but Terry is technically just made of ones and zeros, so they are able to slap him silly regardless. On my second try I do some Bethesda patented rock climbing and just head straight for the corpse of the thief to retrieve one of the many mystical floating paintbrushes that this game contains. One of the trolls did follow me back, but lucky for everyone, Wraith here does a shocking amount of damage with his fists, and much like Boris in the sewers, is able to help me whittle down the troll, giving him just enough time to paint us away home. I am rewarded an apron for my efforts, and then I am promptly kicked out of their house. While I was in Coral, one of the citizens marked Azura's shrine on my map, and seeing how I would need a Daedric artifact for the next main quest anyway, I decide that I might as well pick this up now. The journey north is relatively danger free, not counting the few wolves, but not to worry, this quest will more than make up for that. I was clever enough to purchase some glue dust ahead of time in the Imperial City, so I don't need to go and retrieve some before I can begin the quest. All that Azura wants me to do is take out some of her former followers, who have now been turned into vampires. On paper, that sounds fairly straightforward, and honestly, you would be correct. However, the problem is, these vampires are really strong. Okay, well not all of them are incredibly strong. A few have next to no armor that even the axe cuts through them in no time at all. The real problems were the two orcs in heavy armor, which laughed at my rusty weapon's attempts at cutting through them. Going one on one with them was not going to work, as even blocking did barely anything as I would still take a ton of damage. Not to worry, when things seemed grim, I devised a plan. I was smart enough to begin the quest during the day, so backing out of the cave while being chased by the orc, let them follow me outside, where the sunlight began to very slowly damage them over time. This brought a few of its own problems with it though, as there were a few scamps in the area due to the nearby Oblivion Gate. For a brief moment, I thought that they might actually fight the vampire as their fireballs would do extra damage given that vampires have a weakness to all things fire. Sadly, that was not the case, and they all agreed that I was the priority target. It's not a huge problem, abusing the nearby mountains I can climb high enough to cause the orc to run off and attempt to find another way up to me, and then when she's far enough away, I can deal with the scamps. From there, it should have just been a waiting game while the sun did its thing, but for some odd reason, it only drained her to just under half health, rather than outright kill her. This left me with very few options, so I bit the bullet and used the sigil stone from the gate to apply the 5 points of frost damage to one of my rusty axes. It certainly helped sway the fight in my favour, the only problem is that I would now need to head back to an armourer to repair the weapon, as I don't have 50 in armouring yet. Keeping it recharged though wouldn't be a problem. After all, every bit of gold that I get only needs to be spent on things like potions, repair hammers and soul gems, as it's not like anyone would sell me rusty equipment. Anyway, as for the final orc, I just repeat the same thing as the first, lure him outside, and after the sun has put in its work, I finish him off with a few cold rusty slaps to the back. I can then report my success to the statue, get my packet of magic stars, and now it's back to Tarmina to find out the location of the Dawn's clubhouse. Well, after looking at the red glowies for a bit, I get the location, and because I have played this game a few times before, I made sure to mark the location on the map earlier when I was making my way up to Azura's shrine, so I can just fast travel there right now and save the hassle of hiking back up the hills again. Goes without saying, but things quickly turned into a bloodbath once I entered the Dawn's hideout. For once, not to satiate my bloodlust, but because it's my only way forward given the nature of the challenge. Far as I'm aware, those robes don't rust, so I can't put them on, meaning the alternative is me becoming an axe-wielding maniac. It's fitting, I suppose, as it is the spooky season. A lot of the members here are new initiates by the looks of things, as some of them run away from you after you damage them enough, and they don't even seem to have the ability to spawn in the weapons and armour, which just makes my life a lot easier. One of them tried to summon some armour, and all she seemed to manage was a pair of boots. A for effort, I suppose, but I'm still going to axe her. In the main room with the Mysterium Xerxes, I royally messed up my first attempt by jumping down and injuring myself, followed up by not focusing Cameron's daughter, and as a result getting blasted repeatedly in the face with lightning bolts. The winning play here is to just not be an idiot, so avoid injuring myself before the fight, and make sure to take out Runa Cameron first as fast as possible. After that, the rest of the stragglers can be picked off with ease. I may have also grabbed the Xerxes before freeing Jalius, resulting in him getting crushed to death, so that's my bad. 
Making my way back to Cloud Roller Temple, I hand Martin the book. Feels like delivering books has been half of this quest so far. And then I speak to Joffrey and agree to get rid of the nearby spies. The thing is about this quest, the Blades know where the spies are, and can in fact see them from the temple. So I have to ask the question, why don't they just shoot them with arrows and be done with it? No matter, I make my way down to the runestone and after waiting around for a bit, can encounter the spies. They are very weak, so I take the time to get some free heavy armour levels off them, and once I'm satisfied, treat them to an early grave, and after snooping around their house for some information, can return to the temple once more, and now it's time to find the items needed for a ticket to paradise. As mentioned, the first item Martin requires is a random Daedric artifact, which we of course already have, so that's easy. While he deciphers the second item, it's back to Bruma once again as Captain Bird's the word and he's calling for our help to deal with the nearby Oblivion Gate. As many of you already know, this is by far the easiest Oblivion Gate out of the mandatory ones required for the main quest. Captain Bird may claim that he needs our help, but in reality he always does the majority of the heavy lifting, as his two-handed sword just slaughters any Daedra that get in his way. His two guards he brings in for backup aren't too shabby either, always appreciate the help. Problem is, while they can output a decent amount of damage, their armour is in fact made of wet tissue paper, as one of them gets taken out by a plant almost immediately. If there's any solace to be taken from this, the guards were aware of their inevitable fate. Credit where credit is due I suppose, the second guard was able to make it inside the tower before being taken out, so he did better than most. Well, with the combined efforts of Rust and Muscle, or Russell for short, me and Bird carved a path to the top of the tower, and once the last of the Daedra was dealt with, I grabbed the Sigil Stone and got sent back to Bruma. The enchantment this time around was fire, so either 15% fire resistance or plus 5 points of fire damage. While having 90% fire resistance would be hilarious, it's just a tad overkill, so I am planning to put it on one of my axes instead. That said, I'm not sure how effective it will be, as I'm pretty sure most of the Daedra, much like myself, are highly resistant to any and all forms of fire. I report my success to Joffrey, and he is insistent on me gathering support for Bruma. Yeah, no. There is no point in this quest. From personal experience, the militia are more than enough, especially if I keep myself at level 3. I do briefly indulge him by requesting the aid of Kavach, which is probably more of an insult given that there's only two soldiers left. Anywho, back onto what matters, it's off to Sancrator to do battle with ghosts and skeletons so that I may retrieve the armour of Tiber Septim. The skeletons are simple, pretty squishy all things considered. Not sure if blunt weapons inherently do more damage to them, but it would make sense. Well, a mace or warhammer would. To this day, I don't understand how an axe is considered a blunt weapon, but I digress. That fire sigil stone I just mentioned comes in handy right away, as not only are the ghosts immune to normal weapons, they are also unaffected by frost. So my previous axe, while it would still work as it is magical, the damage output would be significantly lower than if I used the fire. The old blade skeletons I need to kill are quite slow, but they can pack a punch as most of them have magical weapons, so once more my enchanted rusty gear proves a lifesaver in some encounters. Other than some of my enchanted weapons nearly breaking due to a mix of skeleton smashing and disintegration enchantments, I didn't face many problems here. After the final skeleton was sent back to his grave, the ghosts lifted the barrier, allowing me to grab the armour of Tiber Septon, and after some much needed repairs, could give it to Martin, and thankfully, this time, he has already sussed out the next item that we need. The Great Wilkins Stone, or however you pronounce it, is next on the shopping list, so one quick return to Kavach, and after heading east for a moment, we can reach Miss Cargant. Good thing about this place is it's currently filled with goblins, skeletons, and zombies, who are engaged in an all-out war. The goblins are the real prize here, as some of them are still carrying rusty weapons. You may be wondering why that's a good thing, as after all the axes I have, have carried me this far, and they should be fine for the remainder of the story. Well, without spoiling much, the excess rusty weapons I was able to get my hands on here, ended up saving the run. It was mostly just rusty axes, which I expected. That was until I killed this particular goblin, and I guess the stars aligned or something, because he was in possession of a rusty iron mace. This is a big deal for one reason, and one reason only. The mace does one more point of damage over the axe. Again, I am aware it's sad that this excites me, but in a run like this, even that one extra point can be a game changer. The difference in damage was noticeable immediately, to me anyway, as the speed at which the zombies and skeletons were falling before me was considerably faster. Even the lich that appears at the end after grabbing the stone was down in a few seconds. Granted, it got a little hairy when I had to drop my armour due to his burden spell, so that I could still approach and fight him, but it's not like he was going to do physical damage anyway, so it was all good. After he was knocked out, I grabbed his keys, made my way back to the surface, and now it is essentially the beginning of the end. It was time for the defense of Bruma, meaning a whole lot of data killing, my favourite. My heart briefly sank as the game glitched out and Martin and the Blaze never appeared in the chapel to talk with the Countess of Bruma, which made me think the city's defense was going to be up to me and Captain Bird, but thankfully the God Hard smiled upon me today, and after waiting a few hours, Sean Bean reappeared, and because he never got to deliver a pre-battle speech in Lord of the Rings, we let him do one now. When the fighting begins, I just rush them as they leave the gate, as they are seemingly more squishy than normal. 
The assistance of Joffrey, Martin, Boris, Bird, and his men helps clear out any stragglers pretty quickly. Joffrey sadly does not survive very long, probably due to the fact for some reason he never put on his armour and was running around the battlefield with his robes on. Didn't have a lot of time to contemplate his death as almost immediately the Great Gate opened and now it was a race against the clock. It's a race against a very generous clock, but still a race nonetheless. The Daedra inside the gate are a lot tougher than those outside, which makes sense, I think. I made a point to kill as many as I could, mainly because running past them all isn't very fun, plus the added blunt levels may come in handy when I face Cameron in Paradise in just a moment. The toughest foe in the entire gate was the one non-runt clan fear who just kept ruining my day. The Dremora backing them up wasn't really doing a lot other than trying to distract me though. I was able to beat him with a few charges from one of my enchanted axes, and then after could start beating down the rest of the Dremora with my new iron mace that was still doing work. With 4 minutes to spare I made it to the Great Sigil Stone. The fact I am using terrible weapons and going out of my way to kill everyone really shows how generous the time limit is if I somehow still have 4 minutes left. With the Great Sigil Stone in hand it's back to Tamriel once more and fortunately Boris actually survived the encounter and didn't get crushed by the siege engine for once. Which is nice. There was also a normal Sigil Stone just rolling around, probably from one of the other gates that was closed, so I made sure to pick it up and it was another frost enchantment. I ended up saving this to put on my mace right before facing Cameron so that I can repair it beforehand and make sure it's in peak condition. Speaking of the mace, all that killing was worth it as now it does 5 damage. So really, I am as prepared as I possibly can be for fighting Cameron. The runts running amok in the garden are easy enough to deal with so long as I rest after each encounter and then the usually annoying fight with Cathotet is a joke as I am able to shrug off all of his fire damage for obvious reasons. With him out of the way I grab the bands of the Chosen and make my way inside and after meeting up with Eldamil, engaging in a brief bout of foot melting before emerging from the caves and coming face to face with the final boss. The battle with Mankar Cameron lasted a grand total of 2 minutes and I won't lie, a majority of that time was probably spent in my inventory switching out weapons and drinking the odd potion. There would be no point trying to fight off his children as they respawn indefinitely and if I did, the entire time I was attacking them, Mankar Cameron would just be blasting me with magic anyway or healing himself. Charging him with the mace and its new frost enchantment was my best bet and I just started wailing on him. He has very little in the way of physical defence so despite the weapon's pitiful damage output, I am still seeing results rather fast. The problem is he will heal from time to time so we can tank through them for quite a while. The one thing I didn't count on was the fact that he can and will disintegrate your weapons which happened a few times during the fight. Regardless of your repair skill you cannot repair items in combat so I would need to switch off to another weapon and now you understand why finding those goblins earlier and their rusty equipment was a very good thing. I was smart enough to buy a handful of strong healing potions before the fight so I can guzzle some of them down to stay alive for just a little bit longer. For some reason he did not try to break my fire axe when I brought it out, which was a blessing as high elves have a natural weakness to fire, frost and shock, so this allowed me to do even more damage on him and ultimately was probably the deciding factor in allowing me to come out on top as by this point I was out of healing supplies and at very low health. With minecart dead I grabbed the amulet from his body, paralysed myself on his chair as is tradition and could now take Martin to the Imperial City and after getting flattened like a pancake by Meryn Stegon at least once, could escort Martin to a scheduled kaiju fight finishing the game and proving yes you can indeed beat Oblivion with rusty weapons and armour. That was a lot of fun despite how daunting it felt at points, but that said you could never make me hate this game no matter the challenge. Also in case some of you are curious, after I finished the challenge I went back and slept multiple times to see what level I would have been if I would actually increased them along with the skills. In the end I would have been level 12 with 82 strength and 87 endurance. Which is honestly not bad at all. Or at least it would be for our normal build allowed access to better weapons and armour as even with my attributes this high, the weapons were still doing the same amount of damage as they were at level 3 whereas all the enemies would have been significantly stronger. Regardless that's going to be in this challenge video, if you enjoyed what you saw consider giving the video a like and you're interested in more challenges in the future feel free to subscribe to one of these videos every week. My name is Norbert, I see everyone, I'll see you all in the next video.